Hey everyone, Brendan Snyder here. How are you? Thanks so much for joining me and welcome to a special review for the brand new solo album from Iron Maiden frontman Bruce Dickinson. This is the Mandrake Project. Album just came out on March 1st of 2024 and it's his first new solo album in nearly two decades. He's certainly been kicking it up with Iron Maiden but hasn't made any new solo material in such a long time. So very glad to get a hold of this here. We're going to jump into it. We'll do a full review and unboxing, and we'll get into it in just a bit. But before we start, if you're new to my channel and haven't already hit the subscribe button, please do. Also, leave a comment, hit like. All those things do help support my channel. I'd greatly appreciate it. And of course, as an added bonus, if you turn on notifications, you're going to stay up to date on all that's going on in the world of music, just like this with a review for the brand new Bruce Dickinson Mandrake Project album. So I want to jump back a little bit and give you guys just some history here. It's going to tie into what I'm going to talk about in terms of the album overall. But Bruce first made his, a name for himself in 1979 with the band Samson. And they performed uh, and recorded three studio albums together before being asked to join Iron Maiden in 1981, which of course is where everybody knows Bruce Dickinson from. Now he did do two stints with the band, 1981 to 1993, and then when he returned in 1999 to present day, still with Iron Maiden, and thank goodness for that. Now, prior to leaving Iron Maiden the first time in 1993, he started a solo career releasing Tattooed Millionaire in 1990. And the project began when Bruce was asked to record a song for a movie, A Nightmare on Elm Street, The Dream Child, which was part five in the series. And so he wrote the future Iron Maiden hit, Bring Your Daughter to the Slaughter. And so ultimately that song, of course, was not included in the film. The band Iron Maiden thought the song was too good to be given over to a soundtrack. They wanted to keep it and record it for themselves, eventually turning up on one of my favorite Iron Maiden albums, No Prayer for the Dying. But it led to Bruce starting a solo career in 1993 and continuing in 1994 with Balls to Picasso. In all, he's recorded seven solo albums, including this most recent one, the one we want to talk about, The Mandrake Project. And like Tattooed Millionaire, this one here also started with a solo song that was later given over to Iron Maiden, If Eternity Should Fail. Uh, that one appearing on the Book of Souls album, t-shirt I'm wearing here, uh, in 2015. And now a new version of that appears on this album here. So we want to dive into this. Uh, the Mandrake Project, as I said, seven solo albums. It's the first in 19 years, so almost two decades there since Tyranny of Souls in 2005, making this the longest gap between Bruce Dickinson's solo material. Uh, features 10 songs. It's 59 minutes long, and it's produced by Roy Z, who's been collaborating with Bruce for over the last 30 years, working on five of his seven solo albums. And I've always really appreciated that Bruce's solo work is separate from Iron Maiden. There's still a lot of characteristics, of course, that tie it to Iron Maiden, certainly Bruce's voice, but all in all, um, it is uh, separated from it. Now, this album here has a lot of mid-paced galloping rockers with, of course, Bruce's trademark vocals all over it. Here's some fiery, interesting guitar work from Roy Z. In all, in my opinion, making this one here better than the last two Iron Maiden albums. And I know that's a kind of strong thing to say there, but I felt that the last two Iron Maiden albums, while I've enjoyed them, have been a bit lackluster. Uh, they sort of dilly-dally along. They don't really kick in right away. Uh, they don't really get to the point in just rock. There's these long, meandering intros on a lot of the songs. And this album here sort of rectifies all that. You get the galloping, fast-paced rockers that you want. He doesn't spend too long introducing the song before it really kicks in. And, you know, even when he does sort of take that uh, foray into an intro or a, a melodic uh, introduction on a piece or something, it doesn't spend too long there. And when it does kick in, it's been totally worth the wait on it. Uh, this album here's definitely got a variety of styles on it and different song, uh, you know, paces, if you'll, you know, say on it. But I think it makes for a very interesting album, very interesting listen on it. The two previous albums that Bruce did, The Chemical Wedding in 1998 and 
Tyranny of Souls in 2005. In my opinion, those all sounded a bit the same. I really liked Accident of Birth. I liked Skunk Works. Um, Boss to Picasso was kind of a lot the same there. Tattooed Millionaire was more of a hard rock record than a, than a metal record. This one here has a lot of variety on it and a lot of variety in good way. Definitely peaks and valleys within the material. Keeps things interesting. Um, this one here just definitely holds my attention all the way through. So the other interesting thing about this is that it's a concept album. So telling a story uh, all the way through on it. And with this, we get a comic book in it. And so uh, first of all, let's just take a look at this. So uh, like some of the past Iron Maiden releases, they come in these sort of slip cases. You turn it around because that's actually the cover of this thing. Um, this is just a slip cover on it, very thick. And then you get this book format, uh, which is done up like a comic. In fact, it's got the zero in it because it is a prequel to um, a sort of 10 part series that he's doing along with Z Comics. But um, right off the bat, when we open this thing up, CD is here. I've actually got it in my player, I'm realizing, so that's why you're not seeing it here. But it just slides out of the top of this here. And up front here, it already is previewing and telling you to go out and buy this comic. Then at the front of this thing, you have this prequel bit to it. And the comic that's here turns out to actually be the same comic that was part of um, Afterglow of Ragnarok, the seven inch single, which a lot of us shelled out for because it came with a prequel comic. I mean, I know that's why I bought it. I'm not a, a vinyl guy. I'm not a seven inch guy. Of course, I wanted to hear the song, but I wanted the comic and it's the same thing. So I'm a little bit bummed about that. I thought when I was getting the seven inch, I was getting something uh, unique, something that wasn't going to be available after that, not even something that was going to be part of the 10 part comic series. After we get through that prequel comic that's up front, they do give us a preview of the 10 part comic series that is coming. But again, nothing special here because basically everything that is in this is either already part of that seven inch or is going to be part of the comic series that's dropping. But you do get a little bit more stuff that's in here to sort of whet your appetite to go out and get it. And of course, it's just beautiful to look at. But I think it would have been nice had there been something unique and special about this. Uh, in the back of it here, we do get, um, I guess, what would be considered, you know, the CD booklet that would come with this thing. Although there's no uh, jewel case edition of this. So this is uh, just lyrics and probably could have been done in the center section of that along with the comic. Might have even made it a little more interesting. No photos. So just uh, the lyrics that are in there, not a whole lot more to show you on that. But regarding the prequel comic, we are introduced to the main characters. And of course, they're in the song, so you don't really have to read the prequel comic. But Dr. Necropolis, main character, he's on a quest for the Mandrake Project. Uh, Leah, who is his girlfriend, is, is in this, or, or at least brought up. Uh, Shaman, who is an evildoer for Necropolis. Um, We've got uh, various visions that, that show us things at the beginning of this, which talk about Thor having lost his powers. So it's kind of setting all this stuff up. Not exactly sure where the storyline is going to go because it doesn't fully tell us all of that here. Um, but it does start with Necropolis in a dream state, which I found to be really interesting because I didn't quite know what was going on at first. And then at the very end of the prequel comic, it pulls it all together, leaving us on a cliffhanger, but it actually was a really interesting way to start things, to pique my interest. And so I am actually interested in getting the 10-part comic series, but I think I will wait until all of them have come out. They gather it up for a graphic novel, which I'm quite sure they'll do. I usually see that happen with these sort of things, do an anthology series of it after the fact. Uh, but the comic has started coming out. It started in January and it's a quarterly release. So I uh, don't know, you know how many parts then are already out on this thing, but uh, you can definitely uh, check it out and follow along with the storyline that's in it. So. Some really cool standout songs that are on this album here. Track number one, Afterglow of Ragnarok, which was the first single, and of course is the introduction to the storyline on here. It didn't actually blow me away when I first heard it as the single, when I 
you know, picked up the seven inch. I did listen to it a number of times. What I find fascinating is that by the time I picked up the actual album and I was listening to this for the first time yesterday, I actually really, really enjoyed the song. And so maybe it's just in the context of the whole album, but I'm definitely enjoying it much better now. And I think it is a great opener to the album. Track number two, Many Doors to Hell is my favorite song on the album. Uh, this one here upon first listening just put a big smile on my face and I knew I was in for a treat for the rest of this album and definitely not disappointed. Track five, Finger in the Wounds, an epic sounding mid-paced rocker complete with orchestral feel to it. And, you know, it ranges from starting with piano all the way to some real pummeling guitar sounds that are on this thing. So you got to get the whole roller coaster on this tune. Track six, Eternity Has Failed. That is the new version of If Eternity Should Fail, the original song that, of course, Iron Maiden did, but started out as um, a single or at least a demo. And that's actually on here. So it is kind of nice that the original seven inch single has the original demo of If Eternity Should Fail. But now lyrics on, I don't know how much are rewritten. I haven't done an actual comparison on it. But the refrain of this, the title of this is now Eternity Has Failed. And so I know it has been updated for this album here. And I actually like the version of this a lot better. Uh, the Book of Souls version never did a whole lot for me. So I was never really intrigued about it when I first found out that it was the sort of foundation or the start for a new solo album. And then that the solo album was going to be based around it. I kind of thought really why, you know, this song isn't that great to start. But this new version, a lot better. And I definitely enjoy hearing it in the middle of the album as opposed to album opener the way that it is with Iron Maiden. And track seven, Mistress of Mercy. This one here is a fast-paced, heavy metal song. Full driving force, pummeling sound on this, uh, courtesy of Roy's amazing guitar work, which he does on here. He's got some blistering guitar work. Of course, Bruce sounds in classic fine form on the album, but also on this song here. And I have to say, this guitar solo on this one here is one of the highlights of the album, or at least one of the standout guitar solos of the album. So... Bottom line, on this album here, I think Bruce has returned in a really big way. Solo-wise, at least. Of course, he's been uh, kicking it up with Iron Maiden. But just shows that he's much more than the Iron Maiden frontman. He's got a lot more going on. He always has. But I love how this album here is definitely a reminder of that. The album is complex on many different levels. You know, it's got a concept, a storyline to it, the song structures on here. It's got varied pace and varied feel of the different songs, the flow of the album, ups and downs on it. And for me, all helping to make it a really interesting album. I think Bruce sounds as good as ever. He's lost nothing so far along the way. Um, you've got Roy Z on this thing who... I have loved his collaborations with Bruce going back 30 years now. And when I think of Roy Z, I think of Bruce Dickinson and vice versa. I wouldn't want to hear one without the other. So thank goodness they're definitely uh, both involved on this. And I got to say with the quality of the last two Iron Maidens, which again, I liked the albums. I just, they didn't really blow me away and they didn't really stick with me for a long period. I have to say that I think this album here from Bruce Dickinson beats both of those. And so definitely worth the wait for the last two decades getting this now here. And I think definitely do yourself a favor, check this out. If you're a fan of Iron Maiden or a fan of Bruce Dickens, Bruce Dickinson, or definitely just, you know, good hard rock, heavy metal, you got to check this album out. This is one fantastic album. It's going to be making my list at come the end of the year, uh, but where and what position? We'll have to wait and see. So there you go. Hopefully you enjoyed this review for the brand new Bruce Dickinson, The Mandrake Project album, concept album at that. So great storyline and everything to go along with it. Videos have been amazing, continuing to tell that story. Maybe they'll make enough of them where there'll be a little mini movie or something at the end of it. Who knows? All right, everyone. Take care. Have a good one. And I'll talk to you real soon. Bye-bye.